Hello, welcome to Hat Trick. I am Jordan Dollar Coltman, joined by Braden Dollar Coltman, Elliot Tanti. We will talk about the Oilers and the very steep hill they have to climb down Do three nothing to. against the Colorado Avalanche. But we have breaking news today, which is something we don't usually get to talk about. Obviously, you are listening to this Monday, but it will still be relevant. So let's get right to it. Here's topic one. Breaking news here out of Vancouver. The Canadian men's national team was set to play Panama tonight in Vancouver. It was one of several friendlies that they have that they have scheduled uh, now that they have qualified for the World Cup in Qatar uh, in just under a year's time. Uh, they scheduled this match originally to take place against Iran. That game was canceled Uh, for obvious political reasons that we can discuss if we want to. But the bigger story has been evolving here in the last week as they prepared to play Panama. And that is that the men have now gone on strike. Um, They are refusing. They first refused to train as a team. And now they have they have refused to play this game that was canceled only hours before it was set to tip off at BC Place. Um, thousands uh, of disappointed fans, obviously dressed in red and white, preparing to attend uh, a very exciting soccer match here. We're left uh, with the doors locked and scrambling to find the news out as, as it unfolded here Sunday night, let's go through the Coles notes really quickly. And then I know I want to get right to Elliot, who has been our sort of chief correspondent on the soccer Canada front. Um, So I know he'll have some opinions on all of this, but basically the, the story has been unfolding over the last couple of days as it has come to light that Canada's men were not uh, satisfied with the, basically the contract and agreement that had been set up by Soccer Canada as far as their um, compensation for making the World Cup and, and the money that they would be uh, entitled to. Uh, they feel that they are not being uh, fairly compensated. Um, they are looking for 75% to 100% of the um, basically the, the money that prize the country money. gets yeah. from the prize money that they get from participating in the world cup, they were offered 60% and that 60% was to be split between the men's and women's programs. And the men players having qualified for the world cup for the first time in decades felt like that was not a fair compensation for them. And here we are today, Elliot, I'll go to you first. As I said, uh, it's breaking news, so I know you're still sort of unpacking uh, all of the nuances of this, but what are your initial reactions and responses when you found out that Canada would not be playing Panama and that this was the reason? I think like everyone, just like very disappointed I, that it's gotten to this point where we're actually canceling games. You know, what strikes me with this story is this all has sort of kind of come out of the blue. I mean, there's been rumblings about this for a while and compensation in soccer has certainly been an international point of discussion. I point to the U S women's national team uh, and they're, they're uh, they're, they won the right for equal pay in their space. Um, but it's disappointing that it's gotten to the point where we've had to cancel a game. And it seems as though soccer Canada is acting in such poor faith that the players felt that the only recourse they had was just not to participate. And if you've gotten to that point, then something got, has gone horribly, horribly wrong. You know, we are, less than a year away from the World Cup and the first that Canada's participated in a long time. And we're having a compensation issue with our players. This to me just doesn't make any sense. I, it feels like there's more, uh, there's more shoes to drop here, but it just feels a, a little bit out of the blue and like uh, Soccer Canada has really mishandled this situation because it's gotten to this point. Uh, Braden, I'll let you jump in here. Um thoughts on how this is this has sort of come to a head here uh well so uh, like elliot i'm kind of new in terms of figuring out what's really going on here because it seems like it kind of came out of the blue but it, in reading here it's like the they initiated talks all the way that, that goes back all the way to march and they were given kind of this what they called archaic offer um that just that just continue to strain the relationship between players and this organization and like elliot said this is this is the the most uh, important time for men's Canadian soccer. And I think that the, just the impact of that and, and this relationship is it's, it's bad news bears is what it is. Like, this is not where we want to be with this, uh, this, this organization with the team, the way that the fans will have to interpret all of this now uh, heading into uh, a very important time for this, for this, uh, for this, 
for the future of, of men's soccer and Canada soccer, uh, both the men's and the, and the women's side. Uh, it sounds like they have some sort of relationship with uh, an independent company, Canadian Soccer Business, which they, they kind of have claimed has taken away the autonomy uh, for the for the programs. And so it, it seems like this has been tenuous for a little while now. And I, I really don't know how how they're going to mediate or even get come to terms to find a way to uh, uh, I mean, to, to get playing games again, because they're going to need to. Yeah, uh, I think you're right. It, it's certainly a, a nuanced and, and, and complex uh, issue. What we're learning, I think, in the sort of as this is all unfolded is that soccer Canada or uh, had has an agreement, um, a business agreement with the Canadian soccer business um, organization that represents all of the Canadian premier league teams. So this is a smaller league below the MLS level um, that they had signed a deal with in 2019 to try to strengthen professional soccer in Canada. It's separate, obviously than the MLS where there's teams in Toronto, Vancouver, and Montreal are the only represented cities. So there's a lot more Canadian clubs as a part of this premier league thing, but again, they're smaller organization and that there's this 10 year agreement that has sort of been struck between soccer Canada and them that somehow have um, caught the national teams up in these contractual obligations uh, concerning broadcast deals, concerning sponsorship deals, and all of the money that is generated as revenue from these different organizations that are all under the Soccer Canada banner. Much like Hockey Canada is responsible for everything from minor hockey, uh, where you have you know regional minor hockey associations running children's hockey programs, all the way up to the national team programs and the program of excellence, where you have everything from the U15, U16, World Juniors, w- World Cups, national or uh, uh, World Championships, and eventually the Olympics, all of that under one banner, which complicates the structure of how it's run. Obviously, Soccer Canada is finding themselves in a very new situation with their national men's team from the perspective that this is not a uh, this has not been a reality for the last, like I said, you know, several decades, having to negotiate with professional men hockey, or soccer players from around the world who are coming to join your national program mm-hmm. to compete at the highest level of sport in the world. So it's obviously complicated. And I think the biggest thing the players have been arguing for is transparency. They want to understand what the deal with this business association is. They want to understand what they are entitled to and what they have left on the table. There's no, obviously this isn't a union based thing, but they, as a collective feel like they are not getting a fair deal out of what they have accomplished as a team. And, and in turn, what they will uh, do for this organization just by being at the world cup as far as sponsorship and all that. So obviously as Elliot and both Braden said, I mean, I'm disappointed to see that it's gotten to this point, but I also think that as far as sort of the player empowerment uh, opportunity that's here, I think there is something important for uh, these men to take a stand and, and, hopefully that they find allies on the women's side of the national program. I don't know how the women's side feels about it, but it it feels like there's certainly a larger sense of camaraderie between these two programs than any other sport in this country. Um, And there's obviously a key bridge there in their, in their national team coach and, and John Herdman, but it'll be interesting to see, I guess, how it evolves moving into the next several months, because this is going to be a very important time for this team to start to turn their attention towards the competitive side of the world cup preparation. And this is not how you want them to be beginning that road there. Uh, if you're a fan of Canadian soccer, uh, last thoughts, Elliot, as I said, it, you know, we're learning day by day, minute by minute as this evolves, but where do you think this goes here? Are we going to see the, can- the cancellation of the other friendlies that have been planned here um and actually maybe just before that stepping a a step back is this just another sort of misstep by soccer canada following what was a very bad pr moment um several weeks ago when they had to cancel their original planned opponent for this matchup with iran yeah things are messy it seems like the organization is really struggling to step up to uh, the scale that the team is now operating at in terms of its success and, and 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 the the fandom that's coming from across the country and you know this team's captivated Canadians it captivated this podcast it's captivated me it's done that for for people across this country and but the scale's a little bit bigger now and I think that, that this is this is a these are great examples of an organization not fully recognizing just how big this thing is now for sure moving forward 
I'd like to know what other national teams are doing. And I, I think Canada should emulate what European soccer teams do in terms of payment and compensation. I know it's not going to be to the same level. Those businesses are a lot bigger there. Um, but in terms of percentages and breakdowns, uh, I think they need to find alignment uh, with other international programs. And maybe the United States is the place to start. They seem to have figured it out this summer. Any last thoughts there, Braden? Well, just jumping off that, yeah, I think the U.S. has uh, agreed on a CBA that runs through 2028 that uh, agrees to pay men's and women's teams equally. But I think the difference there just being the um, – uh, the size of the program, the, the, the funding behind those programs as well, that kind of has uh, maybe made it easier for them to uh, get to a place where they can then actually uh, reach some sort of a deal like that. But I think that, like you said, following off of what the U S has been able to do, because it, it wasn't easy for them for a long time as well. Um, so I think, I think, I mean, I, God, I hope they figure it out. I really do. I mean, uh, kudos to the players for really taking a stand because they need to. And if the team's going to, and the program as a whole is going to continue to make an impact in Canada, that then, then it, the structures need to be in place to support that uh, moving forward. Uh, and I'll just tie it up with this. this is another great example of the stellar reporting of our favorite reporter here at this podcast, Rick Westhead, who <laughs> broke this story once again. Rick Westhead, wow. I don't know uh, if there are enough uh, accolades going his way for just the important journalism he's doing outside of the day to day coverage of sports, but he is quickly becoming Canada's go to source for all of the things that we should know uh, outside of the games themselves when it comes to sports. And there is nobody at any other uh, rival organization right now touching him. So uh, I, I, an early hats off to Rick Westhead. Uh, that's topic one. Do you like fast cars? Do you like when they race? Whether you're a seasoned Formula One fan or you've just discovered the rush of racing... Check out the Pit Stop Podcast presented by the Ordinary Podcasting Network. Join Jordan, Tyler, and Braden each week as they recap every race as well as break down the biggest stories on and off the track, all before setting you up for the next race in the Formula One schedule. The Pit Stop Podcast is available anywhere you get your podcast. Topic two, I promise we would address it. It's going to feel like old news very quickly, but if you're listening to this oh. during the day on Monday, I know that uh, you are eagerly anticipating game four of what could be uh, the end of the Oilers season or the beginning of the road back. Only three teams um, in the history of the NHL, pardon me, four teams, four. if you go far enough back, because technically Toronto did it in the Stanley Cup Finals in 1942, but that feels like a completely different game. But there are four teams in the history of the NHL to come back from being down 3 nothing in the playoffs. The 1975 New York Islanders, who beat the Penguins. The 2010 Boston Bruins, um, who beat Phil, or pardon me, the Philadelphia Flyers who beat Boston uh, in 2010 had those backwards and the Los Angeles Kings uh, are the other team to do it against the San Jose Sharks in 2014. Can the Oilers uh, beat all the odds, Elliot, and win four games in a row to make it to the Stanley Cup finals at this point? Uh, and, and do they have enough healthy bodies and enough uh, firepower left in the tank to do that? from where we stand today, Sunday night? No, absolutely not. I mean, like, let's be frank here. In all of those examples, the teams were close and they were coin flips and three games straight, it, it flipped one way and four games the other way, it flipped the other way. Uh, one way and then the other way, right? I don't think we've seen anything to suggest that the two teams playing against each other, the Avs and the Oilers, are close in terms of skill and capacity. Certainly, uh, Edmonton has firepower. And Edmonton's had a great run, and it's been a great playoffs. Um, but in every aspect, from forwards to defensemen to goaltending, arguably coaching, uh, the Oilers are overmatched. And I think we're seeing that in this series thus far. So, no, I don't think we're going to see the Oilers come back. Braden, I know you're going to say that you want them to, but in your heart of hearts, <laughs> having watched this team all season long and now through the playoffs, do the Oilers have uh, enough left to make the insurmountable possible? Well, I'm going to let Elliot be frank, and I will remain as Braden, who is ever the optimist. And I think, yes, they do have what it takes. They won four in a row against a very difficult Calgary Flames team this series, this playoffs. 
Uh, they have the, I think they have the ability to go one game at a time, which is what Jay Woodcroft has preached from the beginning of his time here. They have been able to make adjustments accordingly. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to be uh, with you guys last week when I was going to predict the, swings, the, the, my, the sweep of the others. Uh, but I think, I think that they have, uh, yeah, they have, they have every possibility of winning one game at a time to make it uh, four in a row here. And, and uh, I, I, I mean, the X Factor... In this series, uh, I don't think it's coaching. I don't think it's goaltending either. I really think it is the firepower of the defense and the offensively minded defense that Colorado has. The way that they jump up in the rushes, the way that they have uh, just those, the, the back end firepower is ridiculous. So if that can be uh, minded, I think there is uh, there is a possibility that the Oilers can make it uh, a win in seven. I think what's frustrating as an Oiler fan is you're watching a really good team uh, sort of not be able to play to its full potential and where Edmonton is. I said with Elliot last week that I believe very strongly that the team that was going to prevail in this series was the team that was going to dictate the terms and play their game um, because both of these teams play a very similar style of structural game. They are offense driven teams. Um, I think that they match up very evenly in a lot of different situations because of that, but it all comes down to which team gets to drive play. And to this point, Mm -hmm. Colorado for most of this series has really dictated the terms. They've tilted the ice against the Oilers and forced the Oilers to play defense, something that the Oilers can do, but not in sustained shift after shift ways. And they get caught more often than not in transition uh, as a result. When the Oilers have dictated the terms and pushed the tempo, that those are the points in the series that they have looked the strongest. They have pushed back in game one in, in, in again, very similar to the Calgary game by playing their game and getting away from trying to chase Colorado down. Yesterday, when we watched the Oilers come out to a great start, they all of a sudden faced seven almost straight minutes of penalty killing and all of that forward momentum was gone. Uh, And then from that point forward, they were chasing the game. The Oilers have to come out Monday night and dictate the terms the way they did against Calgary, because that is where they found success. If they can do that, they can win a game. If they can do that four times in a row, they have a chance, but it is an incredibly steep hill. And I think as Elliot, you said at the beginning, you know, we're seeing the quality of Colorado at a higher level right now than the quality of Edmonton. Um, I'll, I'll ask you one more question, Elliot, and, and I'll reframe it. I asked you if they could win the series. Let me start this way. Are the Oilers capable of preventing a sweep to start? Do you think they have enough left in the tank to win one game to, to start the comeback? Or is this game series already kind of over just based on where they are emotionally, do you think? Well, I think losing Evander Kane is a massive blow. He's been suspended, won't play game four. So that really hurts your chances. I think they're going to be very difficult to beat in game four. I think this they're going to play desperate. This is the last game of the season, potentially. Uh, And so they're playing at home. That place was rocking. I mean, when, when, when it started up, you could tell it was noticeable. And I think for the first time, Colorado looked like as a team, noticeably shook by that environment. So I absolutely believe that they can win the next game. Yeah, absolutely. And I think they may because that's what it is. All right. And I'll, I'll ask Braden this because we already know you believe they can. Here's the more important and more pressing question as an Oiler fan right now to set yourself up for success Monday night. Who do you put in goal? Oh, interesting. I, I, I would have said game one should have been Koskinen and the last three game one should have been Koskinen. And the next game one, if we get there should be Koskinen. But I think Mike Smith, you, you've already determined Koskinen's out. Uh, he's leaving the team. You, you've kind of, you've kind of done that already. Uh, I think Mike Smith is the guy that brought you there. He, he, he clearly has a way of, I mean, the frustrating thing with Mike Smith is the fact that the, those, those little squeaky goals get in those, those plays that, uh, you know, you just, but the, at the same time, that could have been a complete blowout last game too. He made some uh, amazing saves and amazing chances there. Uh, I think to answer your question, Mike Smith's the guy, um, you know, one of the one of the things that 
Connor mentioned at the end of uh, in the presser at the end of game three, there was it, it's a game of inches, you know, like we, we hit the post and then they scored. <laughs> so I, I don't think that we're being completely manhandled in this series uh, game by game. There's there's momentum shifts, there's momentum swings. Uh, but I do think that they have every chance of, of winning one game at a time uh, with Mike Smith and net. You know, the, the one interesting piece of this, though, on the other side is, you know, Kemper had like a terrible save uh, percentage going into this series. Uh, he had some sort of injury where he can't see or something right now. Concussion. And all the, and, and so Francois, like everybody's like, yeah, this is great backup. He's playing amazing. The, the interesting thing with him, he's a right handed goal yeah. we haven't faced that this yeah. series and you rarely face that at all Season. so yep. the, just the mindset of of shooting in the, the you know you see some of those dumps that go that should be blocker side and all of a sudden he's catching them in his in his glove i'm i'm interested to know how much that's affecting uh uh the the, the offense for the oilers as well i think the thing for me uh, to, to sort of summarize where i think both of you have already pointed to the big thing for me is it's like the Oilers are clearly capable of playing better hockey than we have seen thus far in this series. Uh, We have seen moments of it. um, And obviously that's, what's frustrating when you are a fan of a team and you know that there is more there than you are getting on a nightly basis. We saw this, I think against LA too, where we, saw the full potential of this team in games, you know, two and three. And then all of a sudden they kind of took their foot off the pedal. The minute they had a lead uh, in the series, they didn't do that against Calgary. Once they had lost that big, bad, ugly game in game one, they played their game and they played it really well the whole way through the rest of that series. The problem here is that because of how good Colorado is, when the Oilers go into a game or they go into a period or they come out of a a really good shift with a little bit more of that tentative, let's sort of play the next five minutes out situation, they get burned. Colorado is too good to do that. The Oilers have to roll line after line after line at top um, tilt. And the problem, I think, honestly, is that the Oilers are starting to feel the effects of playoff hockey. Darnell Nurse clearly not feeling 100%. We know that. He's clearly injured. Leon Dreisaitl looked like a shell of himself in Game 3, from my eyes. After that slew foot hit, which clearly re-aggravated the ankle, he couldn't skate backwards. He had no no lateral transitional mobility and just did not look like the Leon Dreisaitl that we even saw against Calgary when we knew he was still hurt, but he was playing a lot more consistently. Obviously, Yamamoto's hurt to the point he can't play. The Oilers have played at a really emotional series against Calgary. They came into this series, I'm sure, riding that emotion, but not haven't yet been able to get back to the same um, form, if you want to use a soccer term from earlier. And I don't know if they have enough runway left to get themselves where they need to get to. Mike Smith plays great for you know, uh, 50 minutes or 56 minutes of a hockey game. And it's in those other three minutes that he makes bad mistakes or he lets in soft goals. And right now that's enough of a tilt t- tipping point for the Oilers. They can score six goals, one game, and then they can score two over the next two. And that's just not good enough to you. You don't win Stanley cups and you don't deserve to get to the Stanley cups. If you can't play consistently like that here. They have an opportunity. Look, they go win four in a row here. They, they, they go down in history as one of only, as I said, four teams. They become the fifth ever. That would be an amazing story. They have the opportunity to write that. Will they do it? Look, the odds are against them, but the odds were also against them to get to this point. So as I said as a fan earlier, I never expected them to be here. I can't sit here today and honestly tell you I expect them to win four in a row and win it, but I, would, I will take Connor McDavid against long odds any single day of the week. That's what it, the best player in the world is capable of. And if they can play to their full potential as a hockey team behind him and around him, give a shot. And the truth is, until that final horn at the end of Colorado's fourth win, you have a shot. And I guarantee both of you guys would have taken a shot at that in October. So here we go in a Monday. As I said, this topic will be irrelevant if you didn't listen to us on Monday already. Uh, But we'll see what happens. That's topic two. Hey, if you're a fan of Hattrick Sports, then I promise you, you are going to love the Backyard Basketball Podcast. Hattrick's very own Braden Dollar Coltman sits down every Wednesday with his best bud, Christian Steck. And together, they break down all the news, rumors, transactions from around the basketball world. Whether it's the NBA or college hoops, these two guys love talking basketball, and you are going to love listening every Wednesday on the Backyard Basketball Podcast. All right, let's round out this week with uh, hats off. We'll go to Braden first. Braden, who are you taking your hat off to? 
tipping my hat off to Minji Lee, who won the U.S. Women's Open by four strokes over Mina Harige at Pine Needles on Sunday. She earned a, over a million dollars. I think that's the highest in, in women's golf to ever. Uh, that's awesome. So congratulations to Minji Lee. That's great. There you go. Uh, let's go to Elliot. Elliot, who are you taking your hat off to this week? Oh, I'm taking my hand off to the one, the only Manny Machado, third baseman of my San Diego Padres, who is having a hell of a season in San Diego right now. Look at this, just under 200 at bats. The guy's got 66 hits already. He's averaging 333. One out of three times that he walks up to the batter's box, he's going to get a hit. Right now, he is on track to have a wins above replacement of over 17. That would rival or be better that Babe Ruth's best ever season in the MLB. He's going a little, it's going a little uh, quietly right now. People aren't talking about it. That's what happens when you're San Diego. You know, you got the Giants and the Dodgers who eat up all of the oxygen in the area. But Manny Manny Machado is having an awesome season. He's a little hurt right now. Do we expect him to continue to do this throughout the rest of the season? Absolutely not. But what he's at a heck of a first third of the season. And so my hat goes off to... Manny Machado this week. It's a good one. Very good one. Uh, I will take my hat off to um, the most successful tennis player in the history of the French Open, Rafael Nadal, who has won his historic 14th French Open title uh, and makes it look easy. He is absolutely the king of clay. Nobody comes close. You know, when we get to the end of his career and we look back at what tennis was through his generation, obviously it was it was Nadal and Federer, and then it was Djokovic who got in on that action. But the conversation about greatest of all time is a, is a tricky one in tennis. There is no question, however, that he is the greatest of all time in France. He absolutely dominates, loves the red clay. Um, Roland Garros, obviously the, the home of uh, the French Open, their only tweet to follow the, the championship was Rafa Garros. And it's true. He has absolutely dominated it. Congratulations to him. Uh, I believe it's his 22nd uh, major. <laughs> when you consider yeah. 14 of those are in France, there's nowhere he likes playing more. Um, he made it look easy in straight sets and uh, just fantastic. He may also not play now for the rest of the year because he's, her foot is in such bad shape that he's concerned about it. And yet he did this not at 100%. That just shows you the dominance he has there. And my hat goes off to Rafa Nadal. Is there anyone that's dominated in any sport, like one specific thing, like the way that Nadal has dominated clay? Like I was kind of thinking the closest that I could come to was like Tiger and the Masters. But is there like, is there, is there like an equivalent in another sport of someone being so dominant on one particular aspect of a game? Uh, Like, you know, it's kind of, it's sort of a weird sort of comparison to fight. That's interesting. For sure. It's a great question. Yeah, it will be, I mean, the other place you might find it is like, uh, the way like Art and Senna or Schumacher or whatever, like dominated at Monaco, right? Or, like a specific yeah. track. Right. But it's true. There's very few examples. I mean, there's another one of tennis, which would be Serena Williams down under, but um, it, it is true that, that this is really something special when you consider the venue uh, specific nature of, of a sport like tennis, for sure, that they just at this, at this one place, he seems to, just absolutely dominate. I have one question actually now that I know Braden's already uh, left us because he has a hockey game, but I have one more question about the Oilers and it ties into what you just brought up. So I'm just going to tag it in here. Do you think that the fact that Denver is at altitude has a factor? Like, do they have the greatest at home advantage of any team in professional sports? Well, not, oh, I guess they're the Denver teams, but as far as the NHL. Yeah. I was going to say all the Denver teams, like the Broncos, I guess it's same thing. I, I do think it does. I do think it does make a difference. And we were talking across like, a seven game series or over the course of, uh, um, and I think, and I think professional athletes will tell you that if you ask them, I mean, they won't use it as an excuse, but they'll say like playing at altitude is different. And I think you did, you know, you do see that from time to time. Interesting. Well, obviously they have the home ice advantage of playing there year round. And clearly uh, as far as Rafa Nadal is concerned, he may as well just pave his entire uh, property in red clay because he seems to be at home there. That was another great episode of Hattrick. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Really quick programming note. We have very exciting news that we'll we'll probably be announcing in about a week or so, but there's a brand new podcast coming to the network, so stay tuned for that. Um, More to follow on that. You can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Please, if you haven't already, subscribe to Hattrick and 
while you're subscribing to Hattrick, especially if you're on Apple, you can click on the Ordinary Podcasting uh, name there, and it will show you all the other podcasts. We have podcasts almost every day of the week now, so check it out if you haven't already. Thank you, Elliot. Thank you, Braden. That was Hattrick. Hattrick is a member of the Ordinary Podcasting Network. It's produced every week by Jordan Dyler Coltman and Braden Dyler Coltman. You can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Thanks for listening. The Ordinary Podcasting Network wishes to acknowledge that the lands on which our conversations take place include Treaty 6 territory, the traditional meeting ground and home for many indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Dene, Soto, Blackfoot, Métis, and the Nakota Sioux peoples, as well as the unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. We acknowledge the many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit, whose footsteps have marked these lands for generations. And we extend our appreciation for the opportunity to live, create, and share stories on these territories. The Ordinary Podcasting Network intends to engage in conversations and dialogue, which acknowledge that reconciliation is not a destination, but a journey, and that we remain committed to practicing our craft in a decolonized space.